So I guess many of you were here yesterday when Robert Dijkgraaf discussed some disruptive technologies. Uh, he, he did this on, on Dutch national television earlier this year in a series which was called The Future, The Toekomst. And uh, he mentioned three disruptive technologies. Uh, uh, DNA editing, we heard yesterday the CRISPR methods. And then these two who are really central to this, this session here, which is machine learning, artificial intelligence, and quantum computers. And somehow the, the, the main message of this television series on the future was that, yes, it's difficult to predict the future, but for these three technologies, it's a question of when and not a question of if. These are around, and, and we know the basics, and somehow there's nothing which will stop them from changing society. I mean, it could be five years in the future or ten years in the future, but... And, and that's, uh, I think, an interesting take on this. And, and I want to somehow look a little bit ahead of what we can expect in the next five or ten years in connection with, uh, with this, third, uh, this third aspect, which is the, uh, excuse me, which is the, the quantum computer. Yeah, here it is. And um, this will be a non-technical talk. I will not assume that you are familiar with even quantum mechanics, even though it will help. But it will not be, I mean, it will be, um, we'll cover quite some ground. And the first thing I would really want to impress on you, because it's the typical question I'm asked, even like this week over dinner, uh, how long do we have to wait until the quantum computer will be here? I, I take a bit of issue with the D-Wave machine. I, I will put that in a separate box, and, and, and perhaps we'll have some discussions on that in the, in the after of our lunch. It, it's mo most, let's say, scientists would not consider that a quantum computer. But actually, there is good news. That, so if you ask yourself, when will the quantum computer arrive? The answer is, it's already here. And in fact, I see many of you, as we all do these days, when we hear talks, we have the laptop open to, to you know... Um, check out Facebook or whatever. So some of you might take this opportunity at this very moment to surf to the quantum experience, IBM quantum experience, open an account right here, and before this talk is over, they may have run their first quantum algorithm. It's that real. So the, the IBM quantum experience, is, it's this, this, this cloud computing which is, is uh, open up, opened up to the public by IBM. And this is the website, this is what you see if you go there. So they have a bunch of computers. This number is the number of qubits. So, you know, we're used to thinking in terms of bits, which run in the billions. So these numbers are, are embarrassingly, staggeringly small. 20, 20, 16, 5, 5, 5 quantum bits. It's an incredibly small number. So you cannot really do anything useful with this machine, but it works. It's a real machine, and you can play with it. And I, I have a, I'm an old man. I remember the 1970s when we had somewhere in the basement of a big laboratory in Leiden a computer. And as a child, I could go there, and I could program it in basic. That was the programming language. And I could do little calculations, multiplications, additions. This was incredibly exciting. It was incredibly exciting to be able to program this machine, this huge machine, which would do basic arithmetic. And, and this is the stage we're in at this moment. So you it's incredibly exciting to be able to program a quantum computer, let it do little calculations, which of course you would do immediately off the top of your head. But you know, this is a real thing. It's not a simulation. It's a machine sitting there in this lab, well, in Tenerife, I imagine, or in Rushlikon. And um, to just bring home this message that this is a real machine, there's this little table here. Here it is. So these are the five qubits. For some reason, they start labeling at zero. I have no idea why. But so there's qubit zero, one, two, three, four. And then, so this is like the frequency. That's the clock frequency. We're, we're very used to that, right? We have a new computer. We ask, what's its clock frequency, which is pretty good. And then there's a little thing here which says time. That's T1 and T2. That's microsecond. That is the time until it crashes. So this computer will only run for a very short time before it crashes. That's unfortunate. 
Okay, still it runs very fast. So, you know, you have gigahertz here, you have microseconds here. You could run a dozen steps or so. So, so if you program this thing, there are like a dozen steps which you can program, which reminds me of my first programming experience, which was Sinterklaas. You know, we celebrate Sinterklaas in the Netherlands. Sinterklaas, 1975, I received a Texas Instruments programmable calculator. Programmable calculator. Perhaps some of you are my generation will remember the Texas Instruments programmable cal calculator. It had 40 instructions. So it was incredibly exciting to be able, I was able to, I remember that I was able to program the Newton's algorithm for root finding. You may have played with that. If you're very clever, you could put it in 40 steps. It's the same thing here. We have to be incredibly clever because we have to take our quantum, our, our algorithm, and we have to program it in a dozen steps before the computer crashes. So it's kind of small, microseconds, which is kind of good because, it's, on the other hand, it's good because there's a queue in this computer. So you, you write your program, you submit it to the queue, and then you have to wait in line before it's your turn. But since it only runs for microseconds, typically, you know, if it would run, for, this is the problem with computers, right? If they run for hours, somebody, you know, takes the queue and then runs overnight and you're stuck. Here it only runs for microseconds, so it's pretty quickly that you can start playing around. So that's a problem. It's, it's kind of short. And it also makes errors here. That's about, uh, probably it's, it's one error per 1,000 operations. That's kind of okay. It makes one error per 1,000 operations, but see, you can only do a dozen or so. It's kind of okay. It also says maintenance here, just to show that it's a real thing. It, it's not, so what is it actually? Let me show you what it is. Um, I, I will, yes, I, let me flash this one, even though, though my, my colleague here already gave you the, the notion of this qubit. So the qubit is like a bit, so it's zero or one. But in quantum mechanics, it's zero and one. That's pretty much all you need to know. It is really all you need to know. And so it's, it's, it can be zero and one at the same time. And we have invented a math notation. It, it's like a, something like a square circle, right? So no one can draw a square circle. And so you might ask, how am I going to draw something which is zero and one at the same time? So we've invented the plus sign for that. So the, the plus. Zero plus one means that it's zero and one at the same time. And just from preventing you from actually carrying out the calculation, saying zero plus one is one, we protect the zero and the one. We protect it with the with armor, so it has, it has a back plate that's here, and it has a shield. You see the shield? So it's protected like this. It's protected like this with armor so that you cannot add them. The dirty coefficients in front, that, that's because sometimes you might want it to be a little bit more zero a little bit more one, so just an extra flexibility. You can have weight factors, it can be zero, it can be one, and, 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 and uh, the weight factors, remarkably enough, don't add up to one. They only add up to one if you square them. Have you seen that? This was an amazing discovery. It was actually a German scientist who discovered this. It's called the Born Rule, up to this day. So Max Born realized that, that to make sense, the weight factor should not add to unity, but the square should add to unity. These are, this is the stuff you learn if you know, at, uh, there's something strange has happened, you know, I, I'm in Leiden, there was a, Leiden is, is, is a small town, and, and it's close to another university which is in Delft. Think, I don't know, Bielefeld, Münster, Paderborn, they're all really close together. And for a long time we had this division, so students who wanted to learn, let's say, classical mechanics went to Delft because they would be trained as an engineer, they also got a different title, their, their job, they could do, could do physics, but their, their academic title would be engineer, engineer. If you went to Leiden, your, your title after you'd studied physics would be Dr. Anders, and the difference was that in, in, in Leiden you would learn quantum mechanics, and in Delft you would learn classical mechanics. And so basically, you know, young people, mostly boys, would decide whether they would do some, want to do something useful with their life, or whether they want to do, you know, highbrow theories. And, and so quantum mechanics in, in Delft was just awarded as an as a elective program. Like if you really want to learn general relativity or special relativity, Probably there's a course, but it's a specialized elective course. And this has changed completely. At this moment, the entire physics department in Delft does only quantum mechanics, and they've thrown away all the classical fluid dynamics, all this stuff. And they're teaching quantum mechanics to engineers. And this is possible because all the baggage which I learned when I learned quantum mechanics, you know, baggage which is Hermit polynomials, Laguerre polynomials, all these miserable differential equations, it's gone. All you need to know is this is this, and you need to know how to manipulate the zero and one, and we do this by means of a matrix. Basically, we make a vector, we put the zero here, we put the one here, that's a, a vector, and a vector, you act on it with a two by two matrix, and this is kind of basic, I mean, most, even engineers knows, know 
two by two matrices. And this is, this is all you need to know. It, this is true, it's a fact, there's nothing more. And just to, to show you that I'm not just joking, let me just move on to the next slide, here it is. So this is actually this, I showed you the first opening slide of the IBM Quantum Experience. Then you go next, you say you decide, I wanna work in Rushley, I wanna work in Tenerife, this is five qubits, so here it is. This is the chip, one, two, three, four, five little metal rings little metal rings, the current can flow clockwise or counterclockwise, and that's the zero or the one. And now the amazing thing is that in this metal ring, the current will flow both clockwise and counterclockwise at the same time, that's a square circle. Now you might say, oh, I know about this, it's called AC current. No, it's not AC current. AC current, it first flows clockwise and then it flows counterclockwise. Here it flows clockwise and counterclockwise at the very same time. That's this bizarre, bizarre thing. And, and uh, here it is, or the first five qubits. So you see them zero to five. You see, this, you see the zero here, the zero with protected with the shield. And, and then you do stuff with it. And the stuff is something you drag it from here. It's, it's, you drag it, the, the, the operation from here onto the line. Because that's the first thing you learn. Basic operations which you learned in math, like addition and multiplication and subtraction are not allowed. So programming a quantum computer is completely different from programming a classical computer. The reason they're not allowed is the following, that every operation in quantum mechanics has to be reversible. So given the output, you have to be able to reconstruct the input. So if I do a, an addition, two plus three is five, even if I tell you that it's integers which I'm adding, if I just give you five, it could, could be, have been one and four. So the basic thing to just immediately, like addition is not allowed. I cannot do addition, I cannot multiply, it has to be reversible. And so these are the, of course matrix multiplication is reversible, hoping that the matrix is not singular, right? That's the first thing you, you but most matrices are not singular so you can invert them. So matrix multiplication is pretty good. Oh my goodness, I went too fast, here it is. So here are the matrices, we give them strange names, we call them X, Z, and Y. That's just the jargon of the field. You know, if you're in a field, you learn this stuff, right? Let me just draw X for you. X is this. 0, 1, 1, 0, that's called x. So x does, if you give x, if you give x a 1, 0 vector, it will give out a 0, 1 vector, so it flips. x is just the bit flip, it flips the 0 into the 1. And we have a y and we have a z. We have it, it is just identity, means don't do anything, no idea why it's here, but it's also here. And then there's more, there's one which is called H, there's one which is called S. The reason why there are not that many things here is because there are not that many 2 by 2 matrices. Right, two by two, made. pretty sure, pretty soon you've done it, right? Or you can combine them if, if one is not there. So, uh, so there's just not much you can do with these things. And this is pretty much all there is. Now there is a plus here, you say, ah, addition was not allowed, there's a plus here. But this is not really a plus. This is called a C not gate, it's a controlled not gate. It's a bit of a special operation, it's not really addition. It's, it's, it's a reversible way of, of doing additions. So this is it. And, and, uh, and you can program and you can run. This is, says real quantum processor, just to, to bring home that it's a real thing. It's somewhere sitting in a fridge in Rushlikon, Tenerife, or whatever. At least that's what I hope it's true. I mean, people tell me Bielefeld does not exist. Perhaps this computer does not exist. Who knows, perhaps it's all just one big joke. They would be pretty bad. I'm, I'm pretty sure it's not like that, but... but. Okay, so that's, that's this. So let's move on. Um, something, something, so this is like, playing, right? I mean, this has been going on for a couple of years now, and this is playing. S still, last month, something big happened, and, and I, I guess it, it, it was in newspapers all over the world, and also here in Germany. Something big happened, because I told you that so the, the calculations which you can do on this IBM computer is a calculation which you can do in your head. So just, it's, play, it's playing, it's, 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 uh, it's fun. But now something big happened last month. Google had a bigger quantum computer with 54 qubits, 55, but one was broken, 54, which worked. And they could do a calculation which you cannot do, not even in your head, but not even the most powerful computer can do. So that was a milestone. The milestone in, in, Ingl in America was called quantum supremacy, quantum Vorherrschaft. And, and, you know, this was, okay, now, this was everywhere in the news. It was big here in Germany, it was big everywhere, because it was like, a, it was like the first atomic bomb, first man on the moon. 
we've, we've crossed the threshold. We've crossed the threshold because Google was able to do on a quantum computer a calculation which no classical computer can do. Almost. IBM, the big competitor, put their entire computational power, the entire computational power of IBM Corporation, and in three days they were able to do the calculation which Google did in, 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 in ten minutes. It, it doesn't mean anything. Okay, okay, so it was not quite supremacy, but you know how the thing is with, with quantum computers. Every new, every new bit, every new qubit, doubles the computational power. So just, it's, now they had 54, give me 56, and then IBM is dead. So, so this is, it's a bit silly that, that IBM, for sure, Zweifel, and Durbuch, that's just the, the, you know, the competition which you have, it's completely meaningless. Uh, yes, we have crossed the threshold. We have crossed the threshold. So quantum computers are now not just around, they're there, you can play with them, but you can do stuff with them which no classical computer can. This is the threshold, but it's not yet the threshold to be able to say quantum computers have arrived for one reason. This particular calculation which Google was able to implement on the quantum computer, it solved the question, but it was not a question which anyone, it was not an answer for which anyone was interested. No, so I mean, this is, this is another thing, right? The first thing is you do something which you cannot do in a classical computer. Now you say, okay, but would I want to pay for that? Because that's the business model. The business model will be that big corporations, IBM, Google, Microsoft, will have the quantum computer, it will be there in the cloud, and the stuff you can now do on the IBM quantum experience without paying, just, you'll have to pay. So, are we there yet? Let me, I, I'm probably going to skip, do you know, do you, do you know what Cotopis is? Okay, Cotopis is, is Dutch. Cotopis is Dutch. Well, I, I do want to say this one thing. I want to insert just, a, let's say, a five minutes to, to bring you back to Earth on some of the hype, which is kind of pervasive. So there is this idea that quantum computers are very powerful, incredibly powerful, right? Because they, they exponentially faster. The parallel universe is, is something which people tell you, right? They'll tell you there's this thing about squaring the circle, right? Squaring the circle is something you cannot imagine. So already in the 1960s, there was this philosophical idea that the way to make sense of a square circle, so to make, make sense of something which is zero and one, is to imagine parallel universes. Probably, I guess many of you have heard of Schrodinger's cat, the cat which is alive and dead. That's the same thing as being zero and one at the same time, but a bit more dramatic. And so also this is something which can, we cannot make sense of, something which is alive and dead. And so the, the, the story was there are parallel universes, the, the cat's alive in this universe and it's dead in the other universe, we just don't know in which universe we are. So that's a philosophical way to make sense of something which is zero and one at the same time. Now, and, and then of course we immediately understand the power of a quantum computer because we'll say, okay, a quantum computer is just a massively parallel computation a computation which is being run in this universe, and also in all these exponentially many universes which are around there. And so we're finally harnessing the power of parallel universes. Remember yesterday's uh, uh, talk by Robert Dijkgraaf, where there was a story, you know, what's the use of electricity? And, and uh, the answer would have been, someday, sir, you'll tax it. Here the question will be is, okay, philosophers have told us their parallel universe, What's the use of parallel universes? Sir, someday they will work for you. But this is, this is, this, this is what's happening at this moment. So this is, this is a, the easiest way to explain a quantum computer in just two sentences is to say, we have parallel universes which will do quantum computations for us. And that's basically what, what this, this uh, journalist, this is a Dutch newspaper, this journalist picked up. He said, a quantum computer with 100 qubits is as powerful as one million, 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 million laptops. Because it's so many laptops in parallel. And so there's this big mountain of laptops. Here it is, big mountain of laptops, and there's one quantum computer which is as powerful. 100 qubits are as powerful as 10 to the 21 laptops. This is deeply mistaken. It's complete bogus, and it's the prime fallacy of people who think they understand quantum computers. And so I don't want to spend just a couple of minutes to somehow inoculate you to that. The answer is it's not like that. So let me just bear with me for just a moment. I will probably skip this slide. 
and instead go to this slide. So, yeah, this is the math. I told you the math is really easy, right? So we have the zero, we have the one. There are factors one over the square root of two, that's this factor alpha. Just forget about the square, square root, it's completely irrelevant. So I have a zero and a one at the same time. But now I have not just one of these, but I have n of these. n could be 10 or 50 or 5. And each of them becomes 0 plus 1. So, and the math is just very simple. You're allowed to do this. It's 0 plus 1 to the power of n. Well, that's something which you probably learned first year, high school, how to work. a plus b squared is a squared plus b squared plus 2ab. Do they teach that in Germany? They teach that when I go. So, so, no, I don't know. I mean, so this is the type of stuff you can work out, right? Zero plus one to the power n, you work it out. And then an easy way to represent this is to write it in what's called binary notation. So you have zero, zero, one, zero, one, one, zero. And, and so this sum here written in binary notation is just the sum of all binary numbers from zero to two to the n minus one. And the x will be a binary number, let's say 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1. And that's just telling me, OK, first qubit is 0, second qubit is 1, third qubit is 0. So this is the math. Now, you might say it's equations. I don't like equations, but this is elementary math. And, and this immediately then drives home this, this exponential power, because this is just one operation, one single operation. If, if, it's these, if n is, let's say, 50, I have 50 rings and there's a current flowing in them, and with a magnetic field pulse, I carry out this operation, which is the arrow. So the arrow operation is done in a microsecond. In a microsecond, I've generated exponentially many numbers. So you see the power, the massive parallelism in action. But it's bogus. It's nonsense. And, and the reason why it's nonsense is this. It's, okay, the notation is very suggestive. It says, okay, there's exponentially many numbers. So you say, okay, give me a couple of them. Give me 10 of them. So you try to read out your quantum computer, meaning looking at every ring and seeing does the current flow clockwise, does the current flow counterclockwise, and out comes one number. You can do it again, and out will come the second number. You would have to do it exponentially many times to get these exponentially many numbers out. And, and, and so this immediately tells you that, no, you cannot take any calculation which would run for an exponentially large time on your classical computer, bring it to the quantum computer, and all of a sudden it would give you the immediate answer. It would not. I have a way to somehow explain this by... by latching on to this, this interpretation of parallel universes, my way of explaining it will be like this. Yes, we have, an, we have billions of parallel universes all doing our calculation for us. And an answer will appear. But it better appear in our universe. If the answer appears in some other universe, I'm done. And so this is, the, this is the challenge of the quantum computer. And the honest question is, so what we need to do is we need to have an algorithm which is not just something you can program on this quantum computer by dragging these X and Z, these gates, around. The algorithm has to be incredibly clever so that the answer will appear in our universe. And the sad story is we, don't, we know just one or two algorithms of this type. So the... the the bizarre question is, is, the big hurdle at this moment is not to build a quantum computer. We have 50 qubits. We'll have 100 qubits by the end of this year. But we have only very few algorithms which can make sure that, the an that we can exploit this massive parallelism and that the answer will appear in our universe so that we will be able to get this exponential speed up. So the, the big challenges at this moment are entirely in the software area, in the algorithmic area. That's the big challenge. And it's absolutely conceivable, it's absolutely conceivable that we'll look back 10 years from now and say, yes, the quantum computer arrived, it was there, it was really good, it was an amazing thing, and there was nothing we could possibly do with it. A little bit like bringing a man to the moon. You know, we did this in the 1960s. It was amazing, it was a heroic feat of engineering, and, and, and but... It's not that we're now on the moon, mining the moon, and doing all kinds of useful stuff with the moon. It's, it's not, right? So it is possible. It is possible that there are technological developments, which is, it's, we did it, we've been there, and that was it. We don't know. Now, let me, so this is, this is what now people are, are, 
my laboratory, many laboratories, people are struggling with this. If the quantum computer arrives, what are we going to do with it? So there are a few potential areas of explanation, of application. So this is the, I mentioned that there's the, there are just one or two algorithms which you can run and, and which will give you an answer which appears in our universe. And the first one, and pretty much the only one, was Schwarz algorithm, 1992. It was a useful al algorithm because it, it, it factors large numbers. So I give you some number with, with 50 digits. No classical computer will be able to factor that, and a quantum computer will do it in, in a short time. And, and this is the type of question you might want to, want to know because, because of, of cryptography. Yeah, I'm sure you're aware of this, that, that most of the, 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 the codes are as a, uh, the, the codes which we use to encrypt our data when we, when we surf the internet, they're based on this, this, this particular fact, that, that it's very difficult to factor large numbers, whereas if I give you the factors, it's very quick to, to multiply them. And so Shor's algorithm somehow breaks RSA. Shor's algorithm breaks current cryptography. It's okay, but no one's going to pay, no one's going to pay anyone to do these type of calculations. I mean, I, I try to compare it, suppose you have a home, right? You own a home and you lost the keys to your front door. What would you do? What would you do if you lose the keys to your front door? Would you tear down the home, sell your house, move? <laughs> would you do that? No, but um, I think there is a startup uh, which has a QR code on the... On the <laughs> no, sensible people, if they lose the keys to the, to the front door, they will presume the door has been compromised. Even if you find your keys, perhaps someone made a copy, they'll change the lock. Isn't that what they would do? They would change the lock. They would even change the door, change the lock. And so this is what we're doing at this moment. So we know RSA is not secure because it will be compromised by a quantum computer. And so we shift to different forms of cryptography. We shift to different forms. And already now the, the, the jargon is post-quantum cryptography. And banks and, and people who care about privacy, they're investing in post-quantum cryptography. Elliptic curves, other types of codes which cannot be cracked by a quantum computer. At least we don't think, we think they cannot be cracked. Because we know it, it will always be a battle like this, right? The hackers and the non-hackers, the good guys and the bad guys. It will, there is never a moment where, where we can say, now we've killed all the hackers. No, the hackers will come back, they will be more smart. We know it's like this. So th this is an area of application which is ingenious, it's interesting, but there's, there's no business, it's not a business model. It's not a business model. None of the big companies who are investing in quantum computer think they will be able to make money with cryptography. None. So this is a curiosity. So what are the applications? Well, quantum annealing could be one if somehow we have hope that there is, that there is some reason as a matter of principle why a quantum computer will be better at finding minima of potential landscapes than a classical computer. There is no reason we know of. So this is something, you know, time will tell. Time will tell. Um, linear algebra. So quantum mechanics is linear algebra. I told you about two by two, two, by two matrices. So it, it's quantum mechanics is just linear algebra. And yes, a quantum computer is very good at linear algebra. Matrix inversion. So this could be one area of application. It could be. There, there is this amazing story of Evan Tang. Did anyone here know? I see many young people here, so I want to tell you the story of Evan Tang. I still have, at 40, I still have like seven or eight minutes, right? Yes. So I want to tell you the story of Evan Tang. It's an amazing story. Evan Tang was an, is an 18-year-old student in the United States who um, got from, from their professor, Scott Aronson, there is an algorithm in linear algebra, which is um, a principal component analysis. That's, that's something, you know, um, that's how Amazon knows if you've done, a, by, by, bought a certain number of books, they'll tell you what the next book is you might want to read. Principal components, huge matrices. And, and uh, there was a quantum algorithm, and so Evan Tang got the instructions, please prove that this cannot be done, that this algorithm, please prove that it's, the algorithm is more efficient than the classical algorithm of principal component analysis. So Evan Tang started working, couldn't prove it, couldn't prove it, couldn't prove it, and then all of a sudden said, you know, by looking at the quantum algorithm, I see a way of do it, doing exactly the same algorithm on a classical computer. That killed principal component analysis for, I should say immediately, it killed principal component analysis for low rank matrices. Which is, low rank matrices is typically what, it means it's a huge matrix, but the amount of meaningful correlations in the matrix are very few. 
This was, uh, I mean, if you just Google Evan Tang, you'll find, you'll see uh, memes of Ev Evan Tang with a, sh with a sword killing the quantum computer. This was an entire field of research killed by an 18-year-old. This is because it's possible. You see, all these, even with, with this factoring of large numbers, we're not completely sure that the classical computer cannot do it in, in, in polynomial time. We're not completely sure. So, again, here is some sort of a race. People say, here I have a quantum computer, I have this algorithm which is faster than a classical computer. Then comes a smart kid and says, you know what? I know how to do this on a classical computer. So the whole thing could still collapse. This is one area which is, is well, it's kind of a, a lesson to learn. It also shows, you know, human ingenuity is, is, is amazing. And young people, because it's a new field. From that point of view, it's very much like the 1920s when quantum mechanics arrived. It was the new generations, the kids, who, who contribute to that field. AI, we've had that, I'm going to skip that. Quantum chemistry. Okay, this is one area where, where it's completely clear that the quantum computer will make a change. It's actually the only area I know of where, where, it's, it's, where it's, it makes sense to invest millions of dollars at this moment. This is just calculate the problem, properties of molecules. I mean, there's no arguing that molecules speak quantum mechanics. We're pretty sure that that's true. We, we also know that if you give me a big molecule and want high accuracy calculations, I will not be able to do that in a classical computer. And it's also true that there's a lot of money to be made with calculating reaction rates to high accuracy. The entire chemical industry tries to do that. They have enormous computer powers. The, the company which is investing in my lab in, in Delft, the Shell, they have, they have thousands of employees in Bangalore doing quantum chemistry calculations on a classical computer. If a quantum computer can speed that up, they would pay any amount of money to do that. And, 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 and also, you know, molecules are big, but they're, they're not, it's not that molecules have 1,000th of, of elements, they will have 50 elements. So even if you have 100 qubits, you, you could put a meaningful molecule on a quantum computer and calculate its properties. And so this is, a, this is the main, and I like this quote by Frank Wilczek. Frank Wilczek is a Nobel, Nobel laureate in physics, who, um, who um, in a somewhat visionary piece said, you know, nobody designs an aircraft now in a wind tunnel. No one does. Aircraft is designed on a computer. So hydrodynamics, fluid mechanics, that has been t taken up by, by a computer. And, and the, the same way that the classical computer removed experiments from hydrodynamics, so a quantum computer will remove experiments from chemistry. Molecules will be designed on a quantum computer, period. This could be molecules for drug design, molecules for, for all kinds of meaningful things. And so this, this is probably the most secure application. It's also the application where the most money is being invested at this moment. Microsoft has made their business case. They, they, have a, they know that the, the market for new molecules is so large, even if they can improve this by just a few percent, they'll, they'll get a return on investment. Now, I have just a few minutes left for the... Um, for the to conclude, and I want to use these few minutes to somehow latch onto the theme of this conference, because the conference is not about quantum computer, it's about theories, right? Me, uh, the relevance of theories in the whatever next century. And um, th there is this, this I'm going to just shift, s s skip over this here. So the theory, you know, I, I told you about parallel universes, the other buzzword is entanglement. So this, this story of, of Cats being de dead and alive, we said with the dead and the, li the, the live cats are entangled. And, and this was very much an area of, of, of um, imagination. Of, it, it was a theory which, which was loved by philosophers. Many philosophers of science went into quantum mechanics because they loved to think about this paradox of Schrodinger's cat, parallel universes, what does it mean? There are even bizarre mystical books like this one here, which is The God Effect. Quantum entanglement, science's strangest phenomenon. It was also an area where you could not get funding for this type of research. You know, it was philosopher stuff. It was, it was, it was a theory. It was a theory which was just a merit as a theory. And I would maintain that, at least in physics, theories become meaningful when you can use them to, to have nature do what you want it to do. Perhaps a better world, but you want to go from the theory to, to, to something which is tangible. And, and of course, perhaps it's a bit of an exaggeration, but the most tangible thing is if you can make money out of it. Now, I'm not interested in money, otherwise I would not be a professor, would I? But, but it, it is the most tangible. So the moment you can say, I can use entanglement to start a business, then you're, you're way past theory. 
that is the, and it, I think this is the essence of physics. It's to use, I don't know if, if nature really thinks in terms of qubits. I mean, that's the philosopher's thing. Does nature really work with cats which are alive and dead? Do these parallel universes have some real meaning? I don't know. But if I can use the parallel universes and, and put them to use to start the business, then I don't care. This theory will then have, have redeemed itself. And, and, and I want to end with this quote. Leiden is a nice city, a little bit smaller than Bielefeld, but uh, it, it definitely exists and it's nice. I invite you to, to visit there. And we have poems on the walls. The walls in Leiden have poems. And this is my favorite poem. It's by Eugenio Montale, who's an Italian poet. And there's this one sentence, non domandarci la formula che mondi possa aprirti. This is the German translation. This is what we should not ask physicists. Physicists will not give you a formula which will give you the truth of the world. But it will give you a formula which you, you know, can put to use. It will give you a theory which you can put to use and, and um, not only make money, but get a better world. And I think that's, that's our mission, and, and quantum is about to enter that mission. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Yeah. <laughs>